Hey there, and welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor Josh, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, paper, your phone, however you wanna take notes, and get ready for today's message. So we're in a series called Emojins. We're building the idea of controlling our emotions and understanding our emotions in the context of emojis, right? We did a, a Pastor Josh did a great, great uh, service last week. You guys played a fun game. Um, I watched online as I was driving home. La uh, two weeks ago, I was in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Um, I was part of an elk hunt out there, just like something that you see on TV, one of those hunting shows. It was amazing. It was great. I won't go into any details uh, for those of you that are anti-hunters, uh, but it was a successful hunt. We had a lot of fun. But I was driving home, listening to you guys online. Um, I had to stay an extra day because we were, you know, just had some stuff to do. But um, I began to think about this idea of emotions and thinking about, listening to what Pastor Josh was saying, and thinking about Jesus. And the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I begin to think about the Lord, Jesus Christ, and say, if it's the joy of the Lord, did he ever experience sadness? If he is joy, if he's the embodiment of joy, did he ever experience sadness? And if he did, what did that look like? Did he ever cry? The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. There was, there was times that he cried, but he's joy. So if we could discover what brought him sadness, maybe we could discover what brings him joy. And if we could understand what brings God joy, maybe we could be part of that. And maybe by bringing God joy, we would experience joy in our own lives. Fair enough? So today I want to do an exit Jesus study that's a word I learned in my master's class. Thought I'd throw it in there today. Show you that I've learned something so far. <laughs> Basically, it means a scriptural study. We're going to look at scripture. We're going to dissect scripture. And we're going to look at some things. First, that made Jesus sad. Okay? What made Jesus sad? In Luke 19, in verse 14, it says, But as Jesus came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead, and he began to weep. He began to weep. And, I, and I, I don't think this was just a little like, he just cried a tear. It's one of those things that he was like significantly upset. He was significantly upset. And why did he cry? Why did Jesus cry? So we have to go back and we have to understand why did Jesus come to the earth in the first place? Anybody know? Why did Jesus come? Save the lost. Die for us. To become a sacrifice for our sin, right? To, to save those that are lost to heal those who are sick, to proclaim good news to the blind. The Bible says that he did not come for the righteous, but he came for the unrighteous. He did not come for the uh, healthy, but for the sick. He did not come for those who had it all, but to those who realized they had nothing at all. So what makes him cry? In Luke 13, 34, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, and stone those who sent you. Is this why Jesus cried? Like, was Jesus crying because people were killing God's prophets? That would be a good reason to cry. It'd be a good reason to cry. Can, can I throw something out there, a stat that I just read this morning? 3.5 million people have died of COVID. That's a, that's a huge number. That's horrible. 42,500,000 babies were aborted this year. That's something to cry about. That's something to cry about. So bigger than COVID and Omicron and whatever Cron, our own choice to end human life. That's something to cry about. Something to cry about. Death is something to cry about. But is that why he was crying? No, that's not exactly why he was crying here. Are you ready? It goes on to say, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathering her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. 
Look, your house is left to the desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and what made him cry? What makes him cry is that when he wants to express his love to a generation, and the generation won't let him. Believe it or not, there are things that God wants to do that he can't do. Can't. Not because he's unable to, but because he will not violate his own law of free will. Why didn't God just stop that from happening? If God stops it from happening, then we don't have free will. We don't have free choice. Why did God give man free choice? Because that's the only love worth having. The only love worth having is when people can choose not to love you, but they do. Now that's real love. When someone's not forced to, they don't have to, they can choose a whole bunch of others, but they choose you. Now that's a real love, and that's a real God. It makes him sad when he wants to love and protect and comfort and heal and be with you, but he can't. The Bible says that Jesus in his own home city could do no good work. He wanted to. He was there to do it, but he couldn't do it because they didn't accept him as the Messiah. He was still little Jesus from the block. Come on, do I sound Jenny from the block? All right. This is what makes Jesus sad. When he wants to bring joy, when he wants to bring peace, when he wants to bring life, when he wants to bring happiness, and people won't let him. And a lot of time we don't let him because we don't think we're good enough for him to do it. If that's what makes him sad, then what brings him joy? Because I really want to look at that. I really want to look at what makes him full of joy. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, there's three stories. There's the story of the lost sheep. There's the story of the lost coin. And then there's the story of the lost son. Does anybody know what that story is called? The prodigal son. The prodigal son. The lost son. And Luke 15 verse 11 it, it says, Jesus continued. He continued what? Okay. Anytime you see things like that, we, we, we want to go back. And he continued what? He continued his stories. The three stories is the third one. He's continuing his stories on the love of a father, on losing something and finding it. There was a man who had two sons. This man is the image of God. The two sons are the image of us. Okay. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off to a distant country where he squandered his wealth in wild living. I got a couple questions. I got a couple questions. First one is, what was so bad about his house that he had to get out? He had to get out. Now, Maybe you remember when you were 18, 19, and your mom or dad tried to, you know, posture up on you, and you're like, I'm just going to move out. I'm out of here. Nobody, anybody, rebelliously kind of left your house. And as a parent, you know, I have an 18-year-old, I have a 16-year-old, I have an 8-year-old. They're all about to gain another year this year. I think about if my kids came to me and said, Dad, I, I want to leave home. I would think to myself, what's so bad about my house? You got it made. You don't pay for nothing. <laughs> Do you realize what it's going to cost you to move out of my house? So, so what's the problem here that this kid has got to leave? Secondly, I'm like, how arrogant and rebellious this kid is. He goes up to his dad in a rude manner and says, give me what you owe me. Give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. I wish one of my kids would come try to talk to me like that. <laughs> First, I say, what inheritance? I spent it all. It's all in Bitcoin, baby. 
<laughs> it's invested. It's gone. You can't have that till you're 25. You can't have that till you're 45. It's gone. What inheritance? Third, this boggles my mind. The father gave it to him. The father gave it to him. So he went into his room, opened up the safe, came back with the money. Here you go. This is an image of Father God saying, if you want to go, go. And not only did he let him go, he funded his rebellion. Is that not what happened? He funded his sin. Oh, that'll mess up your theology right there. He did. He funded it. He gave him the money to go. I don't understand that part. I'll have to ask God about it when I get to heaven. If it was my kid, hey, can you bring me a, um, a, a towel, B? If it was my kid, I would have grabbed him by the hair, threw them in their bedroom, and locked them in. No, you ain't going nowhere. Do you realize we're in a pandemic? You can go, but you better wear a mask. I, I, I wouldn't let it happen, but this boy leaves the house pocket full of money. He's loaded. He's got all his life's inheritance, and he starts to party. He's going wild. Nothing is stopping him. Oh, he's getting all these friends. He's like, y'all, the bottle's on me tonight. Ah, another round. It's on me. Come on, let's party. He's throwing money left and right. He's the king. And what's interesting but not surprising, unfortunately, he lost it all. I can see him at a gambling table playing roulette. Chasing the Reds, losing it all. Luke 15, verse 14, after he had spent it all, after he had spent everything, a severe famine came to the whole country, and it began to be in need. And this word need isn't like us where it's like, oh, man, I missed lunch. I'm kind of hungry. I need something to eat. This need is like he is starving. He's starving to death. No doubt he's lost a tremendous amount of weight. He's starving. He ran out of money. All his friends left him. It's funny how he's buying rounds, but no one's buying him around. I'll tell you, sometimes you can buy your friends for a moment. For a moment. You can be the life of the party for a moment. Verse 15. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed pigs. This boy's a Jewish boy. He can't eat pig. So he's here in a pig pen feeding something that can never feed him. I wonder if you've ever fed an addiction that can't feed you. I wonder if you've ever fed a belief that can't feed you. I wonder if you've ever fed depression that can't feed you, that you fed limiting beliefs that can never feed your future. He's sitting there feeding something and caring for something that can never nourish him. It's exhausting. It's exhausting wasting your life chasing and feeding things that can't feed you. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. He was willing to eat pig food, but look at that, but no one gave him anything. He couldn't even eat the pig food. He was willing to eat it. I mean, how hungry and desperate. I mean, this is below eating out of a garbage can. Now, I'm going to ask you, have you ever been in a situation where you didn't intentionally drift far, but you found yourself far from your purpose? I didn't intentionally drift away, but I found myself far away. I didn't intentionally drift away from my spouse, but we're kind of far apart. I didn't intentionally drift away from my values and my principles, but I'm kind of far apart. I didn't intentionally drift away from God, but dang, God, where are you? And this is the place of the younger son. He's lost. He's hungry. 
He's cold. He's willing to do things he would have never done in a healthy state. Mistake after mistake, he finds himself lost. I was on this trip in Colorado, and I took a 400-yard shot at an elk. I was on one mountaintop. There's a great valley between, and there was another mountaintop, and it, the elk was on that mountain that I shot at 400 yards away. So I shoot. I can't tell because it's very, very far shot whether I hit this thing, but I need to go look. So I'm with my hunting partner. I say, hey, you stay here. I'm going to go check to see if I got this thing. I say, but I don't want to be weighed down, so keep my backpack, keep all my stuff. I'm just going to take the rifle, and I'm going to go. So I take this trip down this mountain, and we're in 16 to 24 inches of snow, depending on the drifts. At 6,000 feet elevation, it's exhausting just walking a straight line. I get down to the valley, and I realize now that this, this mountain is a lot steeper than I thought, but I start climbing, and I get up to where I believe I think I shot at, but I now remember that I didn't bring my flashlight because my flashlight was in my bag. I left my bag on the other mountain. The only light that I have is my cell phone, and it's getting dark. It's, it's getting, like, dark, dark. So I'm using my flashlight, trying to see if I can find anything where I shot. Come to find out the next day, I was, like, way off. I was, like like a quarter mile away from where I actually shot. But in the dark, I thought I was right on. So I'm walking across this hill, I'm trying to find, or this mountaintop, I'm trying to find any signs of anything, and, and, and I slip and I fall. I hyperextend my knee, I slip, I go off this little embankment, I tumble head over heel, and I stop right before like a cliff. Only God. But it was awesome! I say it's awesome now because I live, but in the moment, I think I piddled a little bit. But I tumbled head over heels. The gun on my back is, the scope is destroyed because I tumbled on it and broke it and whatever else. And so, like, I'm kind of upset or whatever. My light goes out because I fell. And my, my, my uh, pet, uh, John DeGroat was with me. He's like, yo, pass him on. Pass him on. You know, where are you? Like, we're, we got our, we're yelling through the, to, to this valley trying to find each other. We're lost. We're lost. I get back down to the bottom of the mountain, and we're both standing there just like, <laughs> I'm like, I can't climb back up that other mountain. We have to get over that mountain to get back to the truck. I, I can't do it. He's like, I can't do it either. So I'm like, we get this smart idea. Instead of climbing over the mountain, let's go around the mountain. <laughs> we didn't realize how big that mountain was. <laughs> it felt like we never found the get around the mountain. We're walking, we're walking. I'm t and now I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm in the Rocky Mountains. I'm in property. I have no idea where I'm at. It's pitch black dark. I I'm like, yo. We got to do this. And we're tired. It's getting cold. We're starting to get really cold. We can't walk. We're like, we're trying to get through the snow. So I text the guide, because the guide and, and another hunter, they were like on the other mountain. I text him, yo, we're lost. He's like, go south. <laughs> I wish I was godly in that moment. I wasn't a Boy Scout. I don't know how to put sticks in the ground and find where, we're south. Right? Walk towards the highway. <laughs> I'm behind a mountain, bro. Where's the highway? He's like, look for the hill that has a light on it and walk towards the light. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I ain't walking towards no light. <laughs> I hear how that ends. So finally, we pull up Google Maps and this GPS and we find like a little trail. And come to, we, we make our way back out to the main road, and we're like a mile and a half away from the truck. It's just, it was a long, long, exhausting walk. But I can remember, I tell you, the, 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 the anxiety in my chest and the tightening of like, dude, we're lost? Wait, wait, we're lost? It's cold. I don't even have a granola bar, bro. What are we going to do? scared. It's cold. I don't know that my body can make it. And, and, and that's what this kind of young man is like, well, I'm, I'm lost. I'm not anywhere near my dad. I've never been on my own. 
I've broken all my own moral values. I've broken all my own moral code. How do I get home? Maybe you found yourself there spiritually. You were on one of those version Bible streaks for a while, and then you broke the streak, and it's like, I don't even want to read my Bible anymore. Maybe at one point you used to listen to worship music and you're just kind of so far from where God kind of has brought you to at some point in your life and you're just like, how did I get here? This boy is in a pig pen wondering if the pig food is good enough for him to eat. And there are situations in our lives where we can get to so rock bottom that the worst thing almost looks tempting. And it's interesting how the enemy will play with your mind. It's interesting how the enemy will play with your mind during a time of isolation or a moment where you're apart or, or maybe you're still watching online. You've never actually like, come out of the house yet and gotten into church and in community. And it's like that separation is tough. Luke 15, 17 says this. When he came to his senses, say he came to his senses. He came to his senses. I wish, I wish America would just kind of come to its senses sometimes. We just, we just believe some stupid stuff. When he came to his senses, when he realized the deal, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and I'm here starving to death? At least I'll go eat the leftovers from the servant's table. He realizes, ready for this? He realizes life is better at my father's house. He realizes life is better at daddy's house. Life is better when we can connect to the house of God. I will set out and go back to my father's house. And now he rehearses his statement. He'll say to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father's house. Those of you that have ever messed up in life, you know you messed up. You don't need nobody telling you that. You knew you hurt somebody. You know, you, you know the story. No one needs to rub that in. This young boy knows he did this. He knew that it was possible that the relationship with his dad would never be fixed. He knew that that was possible. He knew that he might have gone too far, but it didn't stop there. It didn't stop him. But the sad part is, for a lot of people in the church world, it does stop there. It does stop there. They got hurt by church, or they got hurt by a Christian, or they got offended by something, or they did something that broke their moral values or their moral code, and then they feel like, I could never reapproach God. God could never accept me again. I've blown my calling. What BS. That's such BS, man. That's such a lie of the devil. The Bible says that the call of God is without repentance. The call of God is without reproach. God never lifts his call on humanity. I've heard so many people say, oh, I could never walk into church. I could never go into the house of God. I'll just tell you, that's such self-righteousness. That's for you to believe that your sin is more powerful than the forgiveness of God. You ain't that powerful, nor is your behavior. So he gets up. He says, what if I go home? What if I go home? So he got up and went to his father's house. So when we're talking about finding true joy in Jesus, the first thing that we need to remember is starting to take one step toward God. If we want to find joy in our lives, it's only going to start by taking that step towards the joy giver. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So we got to walk towards the Lord. The, the, guy, the guy says, walk towards the light on the top of the hill. Ironic. I, are you ready for this? I can't make this up. I almost feel like I am, but I'm not. You will have to ask John to clarify and and. and tell you the truth about this. Once we get to a clearing and we can look at the light that he's talking about, it was a lidded cross on top of a mountain. I, listen, I, I'm not making that up. 
for real. Somebody, I don't know who, they got a lidded cross and sitting on top of this mountain, and that was the light that we had to walk towards to get out of our situation. Take one step towards the Father. As we were getting out of these woods, it was one hellacious step at a time in 16 to 24 inches of snow, <laughs> one at a time for two miles towards our mark, towards our goal, towards our destiny. You got to walk towards God. This boy decided, I need to get home. So he takes the most important step he could ever take. And in his case, it was probably north, but we were going south towards his father. And watch what happens. He gets up. He got up, went to his father's house. But while he was still a long way off, I don't know how far that is, but I drove through Kansas on my way home from Colorado. What a miserable state. There's nothing in Kansas. There's nothing in Kansas. I don't know if it was corn or wheat. It had already been harvested. It was like this. And I mean, for miles, hundreds of miles, there's nothing. Just farmland as far as you could see. And so I just thought to myself, like, maybe he came walking up over the crest, over the horizon. And his father could just see the silhouette. And maybe they were in Kansas. So the only person walking is his son to his house. <laughs> It says, when he saw him afar off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And I got to tell you, this doesn't make sense. Because in this society, in this tradition, the father never ran. Men didn't run. It was disgraceful for men to run. Nor would they run to a fallen child. Nor would they put their arm, nor would they caress them and kiss them in that manner. The child would have to caress and kiss the father. The father would never caress and kiss the child. It was dishonoring. And I love this because God is saying that He's going to break the rules. He's going to break the rules when His kids come home. He's going to break the rules. When a son who's lost is found. And I love this picture. I love this image of a dad running out. The son has his apology speech worked out. He knows what he's going to say. And ah, shut up. <laughs> but father, I have said, ah. Doesn't matter. You're home. You're home. I don't expect my position back. Ah! I don't expect to be a son. Ah! We have all these stories that we make up in our mind. We have all these stories about what God's thinking about us. And how God's disappointed or maybe he's happy and God's really happy when I spend an hour a day with him. But he's not so happy if I don't. Ah! Shut up. This is a picture of the heavenly father towards us. We see a father who runs in love to his children. And notice what's not said. What's, notice what's not said. The father never said, boy, you stink. You know the boy stink. You know he stank. You know he ain't got no deodorant on. You know that, right? You know he got dirty drawers on. Huh? Fall. <laughs> you know he'd been feeding pigs in a pig pen. He's covered in pig feces. And the father never says, boy, go take a shower first. Boy, get cleaned up. Then you can be in my presence. He never said, go confess your sin, then you can come near me. He never said, clean up your behavior, then you can come to me. Yeah. With weeping and joy, my son, 
my son. Look what he says in verse 22. But the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe. Bring the best robe, not just a robe. Bring the best robe. Bring the most expensive thing I've got and put it on my son. Put a ring on his hand. The, the, the ring on the right hand symbolized authority. It symbolized leadership. It symbolized power. The servants were coming and putting a ring of authority and leadership on a dirty, stank boy. They're putting a ring on the dirty, stank boy that will now be their leader. Put sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is now alive again. He was lost and he's now found. So they began to celebrate. I love, I love, I love that he put his best robe on a dirty son. He didn't make him clean up. He didn't make him repent. He didn't even let him say his rehearsed story. He said, you're my son. You're my son. And you're, the, you're my son. And you're my son. And, and, and you're my son. And your position of son is my son. You will never eat the servant food. You eat at my right hand. I love this picture. Because he's saying, come as you are. Come as you are. The father's so elated, but remember that's not really the end of the story. This brought great joy, but there's how many brothers? Two brothers and there's an older brother. And the older brother's coming back from a trip. He calls to one of the servants in verse 26. Hey man, what's going on? Your brother has returned, they replied. And your father has killed a fatted calf because he's come back home safe and sound. And the older brother's like, great. He's not happy. My dad's throwing a party for my bum brother. Went and spoiled all his stuff. What a jerk. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in the house. I want you to see something today. I want you to see something today. Because a lot of people, a lot of people miss this point. So the father went out and pleaded with him. The father walked out to find the young brother who was lost. And he walks out to restore relationship to the older brother who wasn't lost but was acting like a bonehead. You've got the image of the sinner and the religious person, and God goes for both. It's not one side or the other. It's not I love one son better than the other. Come on, somebody. You've got this older brother who technically was still physically at home, but I wonder how distant his heart was from his dad. I think there's people who they've been in church a long time, but they're not connected to the heart of God. They're more worried about the seat that they always sit in instead of the first time guest who's sitting in their seat. What an honor that a first time guest doesn't know that that's your seat that you didn't pay for. What an honor, what an honor when someone comes into church and they don't know how they're supposed to act. What an honor when someone comes into church and they don't know what a cup full of purple juice with a little cookie on top is. What an honor! But it's easy for the older brothers who've been in church a long time, who know the systems, who knows the world. Oh, praise the Lord, highly favored and deeply loved. We know the language, but we don't know the heart. We got the perfume, the deodorant, we smell the right way. But the Bible says the self-righteousness is as dirty as a filthy rag. One son was physically distancing himself from the father. The second was emotionally distancing himself. And I want to tell you this today. In order for us to experience true joy with Christ, we need to enjoy a relationship instead of following the rules. A relationship 
instead of a set of rules. Now, rules are there for your protection, not God's. But the relationship is there so that we enjoy His presence. A relationship. Could you imagine only talking to your spouse on Sunday for 35 minutes? It wouldn't be much of a relationship. Like, what does your week look like with God? What does the rest of the week look like? Like, like I'm just telling you, if your Facebook time outweighs your Bible time, you're going to be a problem in life. You're going to be a problem. When you watch more news than you read emotionally stimulating and intelligent, healthy things, you're going to be a problem in life. You can't feed on the enemy's information and live a healthy spiritual life. It just can't happen. It just can't. You can't be an athlete eating McDonald's. It, just, it can't happen. And this isn't a put down. This isn't a bow bow. This isn't, and we're just talking about having joy. We have the Holy Spirit, the joy of the Lord is our strength. But it's like church people are some of the most miserable people there are. And we have a hope in eternal life. But you know where the frustration comes? When we do nothing with it. When we have the answer, but we leave it on a shelf. That's where frustration comes. That, that's, where, that's where the aggravation comes. It's not about rules with Jesus. It's never been about rules with Jesus. Jesus broke all the rules. It was suffer not people to come to me. Don't stop people from coming to me. Let everybody who wants to come hang out with me. I got a lot to tell them. I got a lot to show them. His fa this father loved the rebellious son just as much as he loved the rule-following son. He loved the rule-following son just as much as he loved the rebellious son. Luke 15, 31. My son, the father said, you're always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours that was dead is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. The father saying to the rule following son, everything I have is yours. Don't underestimate your value to me. Don't underestimate who you are to me. You're my son. Everything I have is yours. It's about a relationship with the heavenly father. When we have a true relationship with him, that's when we experience joy. When we have a true relationship with Him, that's when we experience joy. Has life been hard? Yes. Has there been seasons that have been difficult? Absolutely. What's your relationship with God look like? I, I know that we make that sound so easy, and I'm not saying that it is. I don't think any relationship is easy. But it's been made easier with technology. We have the Bible on our phones. We have devotionals on our phones. We literally can like download something that someone else wrote and read it. Are you building a relationship with God this year? Are you getting into a relationship with God? If there's not joy, if there's only anxiety, if there's only depression, if there's only fear, if there's only worry, if there's only anger, I would dare say you don't spend a lot of time working on your relationship with God. I'm not putting any shame to that. I'm just saying if you plant apples, you're going to grow apple trees. It's the fruit of what you have. Someone telling me that I go to the gym every single day, but they're 500 pounds overweight. You may go to the gym, but you ain't doing anything at the gym. You're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. You may have a Bible, but if you don't ever open it, the fruit speaks for itself. The third way that we can experience true joy with God is by bringing people along with us for the journey. Who are you talking to about your faith? 
Who are you talking to about what you've read? Who are you bringing along the journey? I've been told my whole life, leadership is lonely at the top, bull. Bull. Self-centered, ego-driven leadership is lonely at the top. But a person who's willing to bring others along with them, with the same mind, same purpose, same vision, same strategy, we can have a community of leaders that are growing together. Egotistical leadership is lonely. Selfish leadership is lonely. Group initiative, we can all survive, we can all grow. That's not lonely. That brings joy. It brings peace. What brings joy to the heart of God is when the lost are found. Today I want to make a plea to you. Whether you've never experienced a relationship with God before, or you at one time were very excited about the things of God, and today you'd say, man, I'm very, very far away from where I thought I would be with God. Maybe we take today and we get up and we walk back towards the house. We walk back towards the good things that we were working on. Maybe, maybe some of you, and I'm going to get real practical. Maybe some of you let your exercise go. You let your healthy eating go. You let your devotional time go. And maybe today could benchmark a day where it's like, all right, I need to get back up. And I need to get committed to this again. I need to get committed to being healthy again. I need to get committed to being emotionally healthy again. I need to be committed to be spiritually healthy again. I think that we go through these seasons. And it's easy to get stuck in a season where we've messed up and we think that I can't get past it. I ruined my life. I ruined where I was supposed to go. And God says, man, that's the beautiful thing about GPS, God's positioning system. God's positioning system is that he'll reroute you. He'll reroute you. He'll find a new route. He'll get you back on the track. And he says, you don't have to start over. You don't have to become a servant. You're my son. Get the ring. Get the robe. Get the sandals. Get up and kneel. Let's cook this thing up. Let's move forward. If you've never made a commitment to Christ, or you find yourself very far from God, I'd like to pray this prayer with you. Repeat with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me, make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online today and you prayed that prayer for the very first time or you're recommitting to a new season with God, would you type amen or hit the hands up button? One of our online hosts would love to follow up with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. If you're in the room today and you either prayed that prayer for the very first time or you recommitted to a new season with God, would you just wave at me real quick and say, hey, that was me, I prayed that today. Anybody else that look across the room, I just want to celebrate you for two seconds. Anybody real quick? I can't really see. Yeah, I see you. Anybody else real quick? Awesome. Yeah, I see you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We have that same book, Starting Point, available with one of our care team members or at the Welcome Center. If you're on the fence today and you're like, I don't really know about this church thing, this Christian thing, uh, we wrote a book called Welcome Home. It's also available at the Welcome Center. One of our care team members can get it to you. If you came today needing prayer for any reason, please, before you leave, stop up here in the front with one of our care team members or in the back. They will be willing and lovingly to pray with you and for you for whatever you're going through. If there's a season of your life where you're experiencing depression, anxiety, you feel lost, and you need to see a professional counselor, please call our offices. We have counselors available to, to set up bona fide counseling sessions with you to help you in a season. If your marriage is in trouble, your kids are in trouble, set something up with our offices. Uh, come and see a counselor. Get some therapy. Get some help along those lines. If you're dealing with, um, with, with, with hurts, habits, hang-ups, holding on to the past, if you've dealt with substance abuse, narcotics abuse, prescription drug abuse, 
We have a great program on Thursday nights called Celebrate Recovery. I invite you to come out to that. It is more than just a recovery program. It's probably the best Bible study that we offer throughout the week. And then we break into groups of accountability for discussion. You don't have to talk. You can be engaged, but you don't have to be. Um, it, it's a great, 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 great program. I encourage you to do that this year. Father, we thank you and we praise you that your word will never return to you void but it will accomplish what you set it forth to do. Lord, I pray right now that this word would not fall on deaf ears, but we would understand that, that, that not only are we in a state of emergency of Orange County, but we're in a state of emergency of the kingdom. That there's an urgency of what you're doing in the land today and the calling out of us to be part of a move of your kingdom. Lord, help us. Help us to see the importance of our calling, the importance of living our lives as a light in dark places. Lord, I bless everyone the sound of my voice to the head and not the tail above and never beneath. Everything they set their hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.